I want to welcome everyone to uh, this inaugural celebration of Spencer Finch's Percent for Art Commission for the MIT Stephen A. Schwartzman College of Computing. I'm Philip Khoury. I'm a professor of history here and vice provost with responsibility for the arts. And it is my, I can't think of a better job to have than to be involved with the arts. And when you're non, a non-artist, and that's what I am, it's always a learning experience, huge learning experience, and tonight will be too. Um, the Percent for Art program was established in 1968 after the commission of Alexander Calder's The Great Sale, La Grande Voile, in 1965. The program, which has been administered by the Liszt Visual Arts Center since its establishment, has commissioned over 60 major works of art located across campus, indoors, outdoors, in spaces that are appropriate for the community to enjoy and to live with. For the past 12 years, Paul Ha, the director of the Liszt Visual Arts Center, has overseen the Percent for Art program. And Paul, I just want to tip my proverbial hat to you, sir, for your, your leadership. It's been so important, and we've done so well on your watch, and we'll continue to. We're honored to have you here, Spencer. It's a delight to meet you. Uh, and to have your work join our world-renowned public art collection. You will be joining a collection that includes works by Olafur Eliasson, Saul LeWitt, Anish Kapoor, Ursula von Reidensvard, many, many others. Spencer was born in New Haven, Connecticut. He attended Hamilton College and the Rhode Island School of Design. He lives and he works in Brooklyn. His art has been exhibited throughout the world and in the permanent collections of the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, uh, the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, the Museum für Moderne Kunst, and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, among many, many others. His major public art projects include a, a, um, a cloud index, which is his site-specific commission for Paddington Station in London, Orion, a light work for the uh, San Francisco International Airport, and trying to remember the color of the sky on that September morning commissioned for the 9-11 Memorial Museum in New York. Spencer was selected by a committee of faculty and graduate students from the Schwarzman College, MIT staff, and Skidmore Owens and Merrill Architects involved in the design of this new and Dan spectacular building. Uh, it's just, uh, it does us proud, and the art does too. The committee was drawn to Spencer's meticulously nuanced and technical approach toward color and perception. And it's titled, Bring Me the Sunset in a Cup. So with that, permit me to introduce the dean of the college, Dan Huntenlocker. He's going to come and say a few words. Dan, would you come up? Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us. And I, I certainly want to Thank uh, Paul and others in the List Art Center, and of course, our featured speaker and, and, uh, and the artist, Spencer. Uh, I've done a number of buildings. Somehow, I'm an academic who's heaps of built buildings, and I've, I've been blessed in that several of them have had uh, um, funds for public art as part of the construction. So I'm going to set this in my experience here in the context of the other things that I've done. Uh, I, I feel that what we've ended up with is an amazing piece of art in an amazing building that are harmonious with one another. And that's not easy because, you know, architects have what they want to do and the artist has what they want to do. But I really feel like in, in a very MIT way, um, there was a lot of attention paid to uh, how to come together as a team and do something where, you know, this is a place where we like to do. It's not just talk, it's talk and do. And the doing was to yield some outcome like this. And, you know, not every architectural team, not every artist could really embrace that sort of collaboration and doing. Uh, and I'm, I'm forever indebted to Spencer for his amazing uh, curiosity, which 
makes you an MIT person, like we pride ourselves in our curiosity. Spencer dug into understanding what people might do in this building, what found things on his own, started sending me articles about things. We connected him with some of the faculty in, in EECS to talk about things. But what's most important is that he ended up with something that's both, I hope, spectacular to everybody, but definitely spectacular to a computer scientist because of, I'm sure, some of what Spencer will talk about in the talk, uh, things that he researched and discovered uh, and asked an awful lot of questions about, both in terms of, uh, you know, colors and the way colors work and in terms of things as esoteric as how Turing machines work. Uh, so, um, so really, it's been a pleasure and an honor working with you, Spencer. I'm extremely excited about what we've been able to do here together and look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, a project like this uh, does not happen uh, alone. <laughs> um, it, was a, it was a real team effort. There were a lot of people uh, involved in it. Um, and uh, I, I, I think it, it reminds me of, there's a famous line from de Kooning where he talks about form and content. And uh, he says, content is very, very tiny. And on a project like this, I feel like the creative uh, part is in some ways very, very tiny because there's all of these other things that have to happen. And, um, and there are so many people who have to um, do a great job to make it succeed. So um, I'd like to thank a few people first before I get going. And um, I'd like to thank Paul Ha, who, um, as, as Philip said, uh, leads the committee. But for me, it's just Paul. Um, <laughs> who invited me uh, with his committee to do this project. And the last project I did with Paul was a solar powered ice cream um, project in, uh, in St. Louis. And he had the uh, confidence to uh, consider me again after that craziness. And um, I'd also like to thank Dan, who was very involved and um, really spent a lot of time talking to me about what goes on in this building and what, um, what computer scientists are doing now. He um, tried to the best of my limited ability to explain AI and machine learning a bit, which when we started talking was less uh, in the news than it is now. So it's something that's really transformed. But it was, for me, a real treat to, to learn a bit about that. and. Um, and to see what the interests of this community were. Um, one of the surprising things was that they didn't want any technology. There was, it was a very, and it makes sense in a way, but uh, there was uh, no screens, no wires, no uh, computers, no moving parts. And I think they understand the sort of obsolescence of some of this technology. And so uh, while we do have sort of moving parts, it's, um, it's a pretty low-tech project we ended up with. Um, I'd also like to thank my friend Larry Smallwood, who's here tonight, who uh, is um, a problem solver. I guess that's how I would describe him for, uh, for me and the studio for lots of projects uh, we do. And I was thinking on the train up, we've worked on a lot of projects together, and he um, Everyone should have someone like Larry in their life who solves problems. We all have, we all have people in our lives who create problems, but we all need uh, someone like Larry. And uh, for example, one of the early problems when we started working together many years ago, the handle of the oven in my apartment was like hanging off and it was, it was broken. And I, it was one of those things that, you know, you can open the oven, it works, and you can sort of deal with it. And I, I mean, I probably dealt with it that way for months, if not years. And then Larry was over and he said, I can fix this. Uh, do you have some zip ties and uh, needle nose pliers? And then he, um, he proceeded to fix the, the oven handle and it's still working today. Um, 
I'd also like to thank uh, Ofer and Simon from my studio who aren't here uh, tonight, who also were super involved and worked really hard on the project. Um, at MIT in the, in the construction uh, group, um, well, Sarah was very involved and Travis and Emma were super, the SOM people. Also, the construction people, um, John Lagasse, who was uh, the person from Suffolk, um, was really wonderful. And it's sort of unusual when there's someone involved in construction who is pro art and really supportive of it. And he was all the way, which was really a treat for me. And then the uh, Blair brothers from Furman, who actually installed the, um, the artwork, were the uh, guys who actually put it on the wall. Believe it or not, it wasn't me. Um, and, they, um, and they actually solved problems that we were dealing with at the very end. And one of them did the uh, three domino problem, one did the five, the 10 domino problem. I can't remember which did which, but they, uh, they divided it up. So anyway, um, there was, uh, it was a big team effort and um, I, I'm really appreciative of all the help people gave me. Um, so. Um, I like to know ahead of time and during these lectures, like how, what I'm up against. So just so you know, there are 33 slides, I still call them images. So, um, it's a, uh, so you, you know what you're getting. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> I'm interested in science. Uh, I'm uh, obviously not a scientist. And um, I'm not, uh, I, I learned the hard way a few years ago to um, be careful talking about science. I, um, uh, I, I, was, I made the mistake of talking about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And, and I think I was speaking rather loosely about it. And then during the Q&A, um, someone's, uh, Someone spoke up and said, well, about the Heisenberg, about the uncertainty principle, I'm an astrophysicist. And in fact, you said this, 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 this. And it's this, 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 and this. So especially with this uh, audience, I'm going to sort of steer clear of the science and math and, um, and talk a little bit more about the art and poetry side of things and, um, and save myself some grief in the, uh, in the, in the Q&A. So um, uh, this, this is a work uh, that's at Masmoca that's called Cosmic Latte. This is, um, as it appears, a, a, a molecular piece. It's based on uh, molecules of pigment that I mixed to match the color of uh, the combined, what some scientists determined to be the c combined color of all the stars in the uh, universe, which at first, they thought it was a light blue, and then they recalculated, and it was the sort of cream color. They had a competition of sorts, and the color was described as cosmic latte. And so this is my uh, attempt to create a molecular structure of, of, cosmic, of that color, cosmic latte. And it's a, a play with scale, obviously, something that's microscopic, looking, looking at molecules that represents uh, something that's more telescopic and like, like the night sky. And um, it's uh, thinking about this work, um, my, my father was a chemist. And so I have a sort of, um, I guess I have a Freudian relationship to science. And I was thinking about once when I showed one of these molecule pieces, and he would help me on these pieces, you know, figuring out whatever the number of moles and so forth to, to get, the, uh, to get the, the mix of molecules correct for the mix of color. And um, once at an exhibition, he was looking really closely at one of these molecules. And um, a friend of mine went to him and said, did he get it wrong? Did he make a mistake? And, uh, and my dad said, no, I just can't understand why he has that little piece of blue painter's tape on there. And it was because I had to change the light bulb on that one and, and, I, hadn't, um, and I hadn't removed the tape. So I, I, I think um, 
scientists look at things differently than artists in some ways. And um, I think that uh, my, my interest in science and, and, and math is, is something that, is, um, that I use for my own purposes. Um, here is a, here's a sort of um, a mathematical <laughs> issue, a, a, really a tessellation issue. And this may be the beginning of my interest in tessellation. Um, and this, this is a photograph of the bathroom floor in uh, the house I grew up in. Um, and it, you can see that there, there was a mistake in the tiling, which as a child drove me absolutely crazy. <laughs> and uh, also, I think may have uh, been the um, source of an interest in, in tiles and their relationship to, uh, to math. Um, my brother's here tonight, and uh, do you remember that? Mistake in the, in the bathroom floor. <laughs> no. See, and he's 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 kind of a scientist. He's a patent attorney. So you you notice people notice different things, um, and it's hard to know really what the, what the source of, of of one's interest and 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 observations are. But but this is something that 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 stuck with me, and I mean it still drives me crazy just looking at that picture. Um, this is uh, a, a more mathematical tessellation example of a, um, a squared square, um, which I, I wanted to get the correct description of it. It's a, a tiling an integral square using only other integral squares, which was something that when I, when I saw it in a book about tessellation, I just thought it was so kind of beautiful and interesting and um, is a kind of the kind of problem that feels almost, it's a kind of mathematical or scientific problem that feels almost poetic to me. And so I used that format to create this work um, using w wallpaper, some of it uh, from Emily Dickinson's era. And actually the wallpaper in the lower left-hand corner was, uh, the actual paper from her bedroom. And then I, there's other paper from her house. And I had this idea of if, I guess I was thinking, if Emily Dickinson were a mathematician, what would she have done? And, I, and, and so this is, this is sort of where I went with that tiling. So it was a, an early tessellation um, work. And I think that kind, of, that kind of deep thinking, like, and problem solving and, um, when, I mean, I remember even in like high school math when you, or, or, or physics, when you solve a problem or like getting really deep into something, you feel like you're kind of at the limits of, of what your brain can do. And it's so uh, exhilarating somehow. And Emily Dickinson uh, describes that as an, a, a poem. She said, you, you know it's a good poem when after reading it, you feel like your head's, uh, the top of your head's been blown off. And um, in her usual, you know, direct way, and I think um, that that's what that 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 sort of intensity of of of, of human thought is 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 something that uh, that's a, a commonality between art and poetry and uh, and math and science. Um, here here's uh, the sort of source for um, the tessellation that's in uh, the work in, in this building. And it's, it's two uh, domino problems that were developed by the mathematician Hao Wang in the 1970s. And these are what I came across and started uh, speaking with Dan about. I'm, I'm not going to get into deeply about it because probably I was at my best in understanding what this was when I was speaking with Dan, and then after that, it was all downhill. So I, I kind of knew what it was at one point, <laughs> but, uh, but it, it, it has to do with, with certain, um, certain possibilities of, of uh, computation using Turing machines and, uh, and the repetition of these, uh, these dominoes. So this is the, 10 domino problem uh, represented um, in it. Like, that's a segment of what is uh, downstairs. And uh, that's, the, that's the three domino problem. And 
you can see, I mean, you can see the, you see the, uh, oops, how, how the, how the tiling works, how the colors, uh, the tiles are actually the squares made up of four triangles, and then the triangles match and continue across, across the field. Um, here's a sort of weird example of tiling from Alhambra in Spain, and it's uh, uh, Arab tiling, Moorish tiling um, from the mosque, and it is, uh, you know, a sort of, well, of, of course, is an early example of beautiful decorative tiling that was of of also connected with um, the incredible mathematical developments that, that uh, the Arabs were making at the time. And it's, so it's always been linked, this, this connection between the, the decorative and the mathematical has, has been there since uh, the beginning of, of tiling and math. And I think that it can be both things at once is something that's, that's really exciting to me. Um, I, <laughs> This is really, this is getting ridiculous. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the scientific method, and so I was hoping I would be able to find like a, um, like a graph I had drawn in high school, and I couldn't, but I did find my high school physics textbook. So I, I just, I found this graph in, in, in a textbook, and then I put in the dots, because something I always loved, which is not something uh, a scientist would love particularly, was when the dots were off the line. You know, when you do the experiment and the dots are not exactly where the law says the dots should be. And that sort of error, that, those sort of mistakes, those sort of gaps, that kind of subjectivity, that's what I loved and, and, and kind of continue to love. So I'm very interested in, in the scientific method in, in terms of um, observing and experimenting, and, um, but uh, I, I have the good fortune that I don't need to draw any conclusions. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so it's a little, uh, it's a little bit uh, different from, from what you all will have to deal with. Um, here's, here's an example of me uh, doing my scientific method. I do these drawings where I follow a bee pollinating uh, zinnia flowers. So I, um, I have a photograph of the garden, and then I have an acetate, and I sit on the, on the ladder, and then I follow the, the line of the bee, uh, the flight pattern of the bee, and then when it stops and it uh, pollinates uh, a flower, I mark that and then create the drawing from that acetate that looks like this. So, um, so that's, that's my science experiment. And, it's um, the bee makes the line, the bee makes the drawing. Uh, it's not, in, in that way, it's, it's kind of a surrealist approach to, um, to, to making the work. I mean, of course, I, you know, some bees are not very good line drawers. They go, they zip across, so they only stop at one flower, and some bees circle around and make loop-de-loops and, and stop at the more colorful flowers. And uh, so th those, those are the ones that I focus on. But it is, the, these lines are created by, um, by uh, the bees. This is, um, this is actually three bees, and you can see there are three different hardnesses of pencil. So there are different, um, different lines uh, formed by the different bees. And it is, I mean, I don't have any real, like, conclusions about bees, but I do learn about how they behave differently. I mean, some of them will like stop and take a nap on a zinnia for like half an hour, which is frustrating to me because then I have to stop and I, you know, I don't have that kind of time on my hands. So I, um, so then I find another bee and start again. Or, or some of them will, will return, will go to one flower and then return to that flower again which I read somewhere, supposedly they leave some message that they aren't supposed to do that, but they, they do do that. And, um, and some are slow and some are fast and some are, you know, move in, in different forms. Um, so they're, uh, <laughs> they're all special. Every bee is special. That's what I wanted to say. Um, I, uh, one of the, uh, 
th this idea of observing and looking at things and looking at, at, at uh, conditions changing and trying to uh, experience something um, in different conditions and represent it uh, is um, this interest has been influenced by a lot of things, but uh, one important source was Impressionist painting. So these, this is a series of haystack paintings by uh, Claude Monet in different weather and light conditions. And this idea of making a picture and knowing that it's not you know, true, and so trying again and trying again and trying again, and it's only through that seriality, through that repeated attempt, um, that you're able to understand what it is uh, that the picture is of closely relates to this idea of uh, repeating an experiment, repeating an experiment, repeating an experiment until you begin to understand what the heck is going on. Um, here's uh, a work of mine that, that deals with that. This is called Back to Kansas. And it's, um, it may possibly be the most boring artwork ever made. And only a few people have really had the, the sort of, uh, I guess, stomach to, to endure the whole thing. And what it is, it's, it's based on The Wizard of Oz. There are 70 colors taken from the Technicolor film, The Wizard of Oz. And uh, the way the piece works is it's exhibited in a room with natural light. The idea is that you go in there at the end of the day and you sit there as the light goes down and as the, uh, as the, as the color disappears. Uh, the viewers are given a scorecard and they write on that card at what time they can no longer see the color and it turns to gray. And um, so that's why it's called Back to Kansas because it goes from Technicolor to black and white. And um, the, uh, the short wavelength colors, uh, the blues and the violets, disappear first because we're less sensitive to that. And the, uh, the reds and the oranges are the ones that, um, that last the longest. It takes about 35 minutes. Um, and even when I served popcorn, there, there really were not too many takers. Um, but it is, uh, it is, I guess, connected to this idea of when we, things, things change as, 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 we, as we observe them. And that actually is, was my interest in Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, um, which I, I know is really only meaningful on a subatomic level, but I'm interested in kind of applying it, how it exists on a sort of physical level. This idea that you look at something and you change it is so beautiful to me. Or as you're looking at something, it changes. And, um, and this, idea that the observer changes the observed um, is, is, is for me fascinating and interesting. And that you never really see the same thing twice. Um, that connects to certain ideas of color, which are a big part of this project in, in the building here. And uh, this was an early test that I did using this material um, these small disks on a colored panel. And this is an example of, of reddish green, which is one of my favorite colors because it's, uh, it's kind of an illogical color. And this was something Dan and I spoke about in terms of the subtlety, the ambiguity of uh, machine learning and how that relates to, to language. And, and language and color um, are something that uh, fascinated me for, for quite a while, and especially these um, contradictory colors like reddish green, which comes from uh, some notes by uh, the philosopher uh, Wittgenstein in his great book, Remarks on Color. And this became the source for the palette for, um, for the project here. And um, those, those are the colors. They're all in between, in between colors. So depending on the light, depending on the viewer, depending on the angle, um, depending on you know, what you had for lunch, the, uh, the colors will look different. And so it goes from reddish, um, orangish uh, yellow to yellowish uh, orange to greenish yellow 
to uh, greenish blue to bluish violet to uh, reddish violet to, I'm sorry, the first one is reddish orange, not orangish yellow. And so it goes around into, into a complete circle. And the, um, the, the reddish uh, violet color was the most problematic one. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> Dan <laughs> took, I mean, it's kind of amazing. He was quite interested in these colors. And, um, and so we finally got, and it was that one that we really were working on, and then when we finally got that one figured out, because it was a question of balancing them, and so that there was an intensity that was consistent across all six colors, and also having them work as in between colors so that people would see them, could see them as one or see them as another. And um, for some reason, I don't know why, the, uh, the reddish violet was the most difficult one to, um, to get right. And, uh, um, but that, in the end, was the, uh, the uh, palette of six colors that, that we used. Um, One, um, this, is, this is a ridiculous piece. Um, one thing I, uh, I, I love about observation is when people make mistakes. And um, this work is based on a mistake. I was walking down the street in, uh, in Brooklyn, and it was about this time of year. There were big piles of snow on the ground. And I stopped at the light to, to cross. Um, the street, and I looked down, and there was this lump and that looked like a lump of snow. And then I realized that it that looked like, like a pile of snow. I realized it was a lump of concrete. And um, it, it was like the bottom, it was it, it like, it's a positive of the negative space of a hole. I went back later and saw what it was. It was, it had been poured into a hole to hold a sign in. But it had flipped over, and it was this color, and it looked just like uh, it looked like the piles of dirty snow. But it was a, a lump of concrete. So this work is called a um, uh, a lump of concrete mistaken for a pile of dirty snow. <laughs> oh, uh, oops! That's Ziggy, my dog. Uh, he had to make an appearance. Uh, that, so there's a close-up of the, of the lump. And this was f first shown in Berlin at this, at this time of year at a, a gallery there. And um, the gallerists didn't really know what was going to be in the exhibition. And like the last thing people in Berlin want to see in the spring is, uh, is lumps of snow. And so, so Klaus was really, really unhappy with this. And then he... Uh, this was, it's actually kind of a sweet story because he warmed up to it and he just, he loves these now and he has, he, he I mean, there wasn't a lot of interest in these so he still has them around and he, he, he's, he, likes, uh, he likes joking about them, especially at this time of year, um, although he didn't have so much snow this year. Um, this is another kind of uh, mistake uh, in a way or, or, or something that's two things at once, which is, a, uh, is related to ideas to, to mistakes. This is a view out Emily Dickinson's window where her desk was um, at dusk when the, um, when the window turns into a mirror. So it starts as a, the, the window is clear. It starts with a view of the, uh, of the yard. And then about half an hour later, it's, it's totally a mirror. And there it is, two things at once. Um, and for me, I, I, it's probably obvious by this point in the lecture that I'm kind of an Emily Dickinson groupie. And this is, um, I, I, I've done a lot of work at her house, and I like go there and hang out like a weirdo. And they, it, you know, now that they know me there, it's OK. It took a while to get in, because there are a lot of people like me. Um, and uh, I. I'm interested in trying to see things the way she saw them and, and try to use some of these incredible observations that she had uh, and then represented them so poetically. Um, she, there's one line where she describes what she does is uh, as the Balboa of house and garden. And 
this idea that you don't, don't have to make these incredible journeys to have these incredibly deep and powerful observations and realizations about the world. It's something that I think is a really important lesson that I, I've, I've taken from her. I mean, sometimes you can look at something simple and it's just it's kind of boring, but she, she found a way to make these uh, small observations really universal. So she's, um, and, 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 and she also loved error and loved a mistake, um, which is um, wonderful. That, um, that is not Emily Dickinson, although you might look like her. Um, that's uh, Sir Isaac Newton. And um, even scientists make mistakes, and I like when scientists make mistakes because there's, uh, there's bound to be something interesting that comes from it. Um, one thing, um, you know, Newton really wanted the universe to make sense. And so he, cre he had this sense that there was a correlation between color and sound. So, uh, I mean, it's probably why he included indigo as the seventh color in the, in the uh, visual spectrum, because he wanted it to correlate to um, the seven pitches of the diatonic scale. So he felt that like music and, and the visual world should have the same kind of structure and, and be, have this incredible un uniformity and consistency, which of course uh, they don't, um, uh, they're, they're different. And, um, but it's an idea that I love and I used for a, a work. And this is, um, this is a piece using, um, using Newton's ideas about correlating color and sound to, uh, to represent uh, the very beginning of the uh, thir 32 Goldberg variations by Bach. Um, so each, so the, the length of the color is based on the duration of the note and the color of the color is, is based on the, um, on, on, the, on the note itself. And uh, each of them is a, is a double fixture um, based on the right hand and the left hand. Um, and <clears throat> there is, um, of course, this correlation between music and color. It's just not as simple or as clear as, uh, as, as Newton wanted it to be. And, um, but it, it still, for me, is an area of, of, uh, that allows for some really rich exploration. And um, this, this work is in, the, um, is in the Steinway showroom in New York. There you can see a, a detail of it. Um, another project that, I'm, uh, that I've been working on recently is based on, on uh, Surat. This is... Uh, La Grande Jatte, the famous uh, pointillist painting at the Art Institute of Chicago. And the last year I've been working a lot on this and thinking about it. And I, I, I'm interested, I mean, I, I don't love this painting. I don't, it's really more of a manifesto for me than a painting. But what I love about Seurat was that he was using certain uh, theories uh, about vision and optics and color, some of which turned out to be true and some of which uh, were proven false to try to take painting in, in, a, um, in a new direction. You know, he felt sort of, uh, he felt that Impressionism really couldn't go any further, and so he developed this system of pointillism that, uh, that creates a kind of optical mix as you, um, as you move away from the daubs of paint. Um, so, I did a lot of analysis of this, um, of this painting. And so here's like an example of analyzing this part of the painting, which is a tree trunk, and figuring out the percentage of each of the pigments. Basically, I did it in a very analog way. I put a grid over these little parts, and then, and then uh, it was a, I think this, it was a grid of 400, and then just marked which color was dominant in each of those squares. And, um, and then, figured out the percentage of each of those, uh, of those colors to f that formed this uh, 
overall color, which is a, um, which is a tree trunk, which uh, if we go back, it's, uh, it's the trunk of that tree right at the, the upper center part of the, uh, of the painting. Um, and then I, I made these paintings that are kind of the opposite. So they, all of the, the surface color is the color of all the mixes of the daubs of paint. And the panel itself is based on the, um, I, the edges of the, of the panel, I'm sorry, are uh, determined by the, uh, the mix of the uh, colors that are mixed. So this, for example, is the tree trunk. It has seven, seven sides because it has seven colors. And the colors, when they're all combined in the percentages determined by the length of the side, uh, forms the color that is on the face, which is the tree trunk. Um, I didn't even really understand myself explaining that. So if you didn't get it, I really, I don't blame you. It's, it's a little bit, a little bit complicated. But in any, in anyways, I, I kind of created my own somewhat crackpot system for analyzing uh, Surratt's colors and taking that abstraction to the next level. And within my system, it, I really am very strict about the rules so that these colors actually are the mix. And in the end, they do make this color that matches the color of, of, uh, of Surratt's painting. So it's a kind of thing that I've, um, I've been on for a bit. That's another one, that's the, uh, that's the dog. Um, I also love, uh, what, something else I really like about these is that they, the paintings reveal what they're made of. You know, you look at the edge and you, so I'll often look at colors and I'll say, what is in that color? You know, how did, they, how did they mix that? And this has all the colors around the edge so you know what, what's in there. And so it's kind of revealing its own um, nature in some way, its own, its own makeup. Um, these are paintings that do the opposite where they take the, the mixed color and then the lines um, which follow a sort of photospectromatic line of the pigment um, go on the face on the panel and those are the colors that mix that form the color, the color on the edge. So um, I'm, I'm kind of like uh, Surratt in the way of, you know, I, I've kind of got my theory and I'm running with it and trying to do as much as possible. <laughs> until the idea runs out. This is it uh, uh, in a sort of atomic way. And, uh, <laughs> and so this is, the, this is an analysis of the whole painting using 40, roughly 40 of the pigments. He only used 17 pigments, but because he, he painted wet on wet, there was a bunch of mixtures. So I, I, I found the 40 most common pigments, and these are all uh, represented here in the, um, in the percentage in which they exist in the painting. So this is sort of taking that painting and, and, um, and blowing it apart. Um, so that's the, the latest. Um, I, I, um, yeah, it feels, I mean, I, I know these pigments so well, it just feels, you know, I can tell where each one came from in the painting. So it has a real connection to the, to the Seurat painting, which is funny because it's not a painting that I, that I love. Um, uh, this, this is a painting that I love. And this is another, this is, uh, I, I, I'm putting this in because it's another sort of strange project that I'm working on. Um, this is a painting by Hans Holbein that's in Basel, that's from 1520. That is the, um, it's a body of the dead Christ and uh, in the tomb. I mean, it's kind of amazing. It's like the tomb is cut open and they're looking at the, at the corpse. Um, and I, um, I, I'm working, the, the reason I've been thinking a lot about this is because a, um, I had a, a friend in, uh, in who's, who was Swiss, who was a, a collector and a wonderful person. And um, I first saw this painting with him uh, 20 years ago. And then we saw it together. I would go to Basel, we would meet, and we, we looked at it together every, um, for five years. And then we were supposed to go during the, um, during the pandemic, and I didn't go. And, and, um, and he died suddenly last year. And um, it, 
when people ask me what my favorite painting is, which occasionally people ask, I say it's this. And, um, and I, I, I mean, this lecture really isn't the place to uh, explain why, but it, it is, um, even though I'm not a, uh, a believer, I, I feel that this is in some ways what, um, what art can aspire to do. Um, and so uh, the reason I'm thinking a lot about this is I'm, I'm now working is uh, Thierry's uh, um, daughters have, at, I mean, this is one of the, the weirdest, or, I mean, it's a strange thing, but they've asked me to design his, uh, his, his tomb. So, um, so I am, uh, I'm thinking a lot about this and thinking a lot about, uh, about that and, um, and thinking a lot about Emily Dickinson, um, who knew so much about death. And um, so it's really kind of, in a, in, a, in a weird way, a wonderful project because his, his five daughters, all of whom I know, are excited about doing this. And you know, maybe it will work out, maybe it won't. Um, but it's, it's an experiment and it's, it's uh, certainly something totally new. And um, it's, a, it's a really incredible honor. And, um, and just like in this project, um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll learn a lot along the way. But um, my lodestar for this also, I think, is, is, is Emily Dickinson. And I'd like to end on a you know, more upbeat note with um, with just this uh, video. Um, I spend a lot of time on TikTok. This would be a surprise for you probably, but and so I'd just like to um, share something that I think is awesome and, uh, and shows that Emily's influence just keeps going. So if you could play that, that would be great. I'm gonna teach you a little lesson so you best be listening, because I won't have any literary critics omitting this. See, the greatest of the poems already been written. It's by a spooky little named Emily Dickinson. Got a thirst for a verse out of Amherst. Want the whole damn poem, not the excerpt. I'll take it down and come back for dessert, because there ain't nobody baking up bars like her. Odd and reclusive, known for her use of quirky little dashes, a little intrusive, 1800s motherfucking goose of common meter fours and threes. Caps for emphasis, she was lyrically sensuous, dedication to a woman, but the censor won't mention it, and her rhymes weren't quite straight either, slanting harder than the Tower of Pisa. Cut the mother poets lacking, sent them packing, now they're hacks in the backseat, asking why, what's special about the bus of a fly, but she's gone canonical, she's lasting. She was living all alone, almost all of her life, except a few wild nights with Sue on the sly. She was banging out bangers till 55, when a man in a carriage stopped to give her a ride. I love her. Um, so that's it. That's it. Um. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions if people have any, if there's anything. Yeah. You showed the slides of Emily Dickinson's house in the window. You said that that piece was based a mistake of some kind, and, uh, but I never figured out what the mistake was. I, I, guess, I guess I'm equating um, a mistake with a misperception, you know, and so it's, you know, am I looking out the window, am I looking in the mirror, and I, I, I see a sort of double image being as, as, a, as a kind of mistake, so it's, it's I mean, it's, it's, I think, different. I mean, it's, it's different than the lump of concrete mistaken for a pile of dirty snow. But that, but that object exists in that same double area where the, uh, the window is clear and transparent, and it's also reflective and a mirror. And the lump is a lump, but also sometimes you look at it, it's a pile. It's, sometimes it's a lump of concrete, and sometimes it's a pile of dirty snow. And, um, and it's both. I mean, for me, it's 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 both, and uh, for me, uh, that's really compelling. Got it. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, do you spend years without success looking for more mismatched tiles? <laughs> um, sometimes I actually make mismatched ones just to um, satisfy myself because it's it's like where the error is, where the where where the mistake is. But I um, I do I, I I really love tiles and I love. Um, yeah, I, I spend a lot of time looking at anything, any, anything tiled, um, and I, 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 I don't really understand the math necessarily about it. But when, I, when peculiar shapes go together in certain ways, I mean it's fascinating. It's amazing, and it can it can be described mathematically, but just just sort of the physical visual uh, how two shapes go together is is amazing to me. So. Um, it's it's part of the beauty and wonder of the world, even if you don't understand the math. Uh, Spencer, may I ask, uh, could you just elaborate a bit more on your work with color and sound? I got, I think, the color part, um, but are you still pursuing that connectivity? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done some other works using uh, using Newton's idea, so using that as a sort of cor as a correlation, um, and it is uh, um, I mean it is I mean it's a little bit like some of Surratt's optical uh, theories. It's it's you know it's been that close connection has been proven false. But that doesn't mean it's not interesting and beautiful. And so, um, I mean, a, a, a scientist couldn't go on with that, I guess, because you know you couldn't get funding for it <laughs> if it's proven wrong. Uh, in my line of work, uh, if it's proven wrong, that doesn't matter. You can still like keep going and uh, and explore it because it's it's weird and interesting and beautiful. And there, and and. In the impulse to make that connection, there's something true, and I think that that and something very human, and I think uh, this interest in seeing a connection between music and color, um, and sound and color, is is something compelling. And there, and of course there are there are there are connections. They're just not as um, simple and clear as as Newton defined it. And do you write? Do you write in the way you speak to us? Um, no, I, I, I don't. About? No, no, um, no, because I'm trying, you know, I, I try to um, not describe it too much, you know, I, I feel like that. There's a great line from a um, um, Philip Larkin poem where he, I, I, I just remember the end where he says, Leave the, the soul unjostled, uh, the pocket unpicked, the fancies lurid, and the treasure buried. And um, I, I, I think it's sometimes when you explain too much, you kill it. There's a microphone. Yeah. The Emily, thank you. The Emily Dickinson poem at the end, uh, I'm really interested in, I, I miss so much of it because it, it went pretty fast. Uh, was the the, the uh, uh, you, YouTube um, yes. video. Yeah, her name is Ella Cordova. Thank you. Uh, e, I think it's E L L E C O R D O V A. I think. I mean, you can just uh, search for Emily Dickinson rap. There's not a lot there. <laughs> Believe it or not, there will be soon. <laughs> Hi. Hi. My name is Pat, and I I think your work is beautiful, so colorful, and I wonder if your um, art, your work, could be used in therapy for people with uh, disabilities, maybe uh -huh. the audiovisual way, or uh, because I don't know. I think you can. Um, 
use all these patterns, patterns and colors maybe to help uh -huh. people with any kind of uh -huh. audiovisual disability or something. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, it's, um, I, I guess I don't presume to think um, what, uh, you know, what exactly my art can do. I, I kind of put it out there and, and hope for the best and, and uh, I feel very lucky that people spend time looking at it and hopefully get something from it. So the pieces of cement that look like snow, uh, I, at first I thought that what you were showing us was the actual cement piece that you found that you came oh, across, sorry. but then you said that there's, there's a series of them. Yeah, I cast them. I, I, I maniacally made them. <laughs> I learned how to cast concrete. And then I dusted it with dirt and like little sparkle stuff on it. Um, yeah, I obsessively made, made them so that they could passes either. And it's all from the same original piece that you No, I mean, the, it ended up that that, that, that the, I, I guess it was the sanitation department picked it up, so I never even got a picture of the original piece. <laughs> it was just, a, it was just something that stuck, that stuck with me, so I had to, I had to go back. Uh, I mean, I, sometimes that happens, you know, you, it's the, the source is something that you can't, um, you, you go back and it's gone. I, I've done some work, um, for example, about rainbows. And the, the first one I did, I was on the F train that comes out of the tunnel in Brooklyn and it looks, it, it was looking out and this, there had just been a storm and there was this rainbow over, over Brooklyn. And um, it was a, kind of a beautiful moment because everyone in the train car was sort of enthralled by this view of a rainbow in, in New York, which no one sees. And so then, Years later, I went back, I had this idea to just make a rainbow piece that was based on where I remembered the legs of the rainbow landing. And, the, and so I, I marked it out on the map. I, I rode the subway again, marked it out on a map from the subway where I thought it was, just went to those um, places uh, where the rainbow had landed and, um, and took black and white photographs. And um, I mean, the funny thing about that piece was that in both places there were big dumpsters. And, and, and a friend of mine said, you should have looked in them. They were probably full of gold. <laughs> so I don't, yeah, I mean, sometimes the idea, you know, there's an observation and you don't know what to do with it until, in, until later. So it's just in your head. Hi, Spencer. Um, huge fan of your work. I have been for a very long time. So thank you for this installation and this, the talk tonight. Um, I was hoping you could actually unpack a little bit of this treasure that's downstairs. Uh, I took a look at it before the lecture, and I, I don't understand how it was made. I'm, I'm really kind of flabbergasted at the technique. Um, I didn't know if it was 3D printed. I saw little nails through the discs. I mean, it's it's really exceptional. Oh, yeah, yeah, so the material I'm, I'm happy, yeah, that I can explain that. I have 100% uh, confidence speaking about. Um, so uh, these, these panels are, they're, they're, um, they're, well, different companies make them, but the, 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 the company that we worked with is called Sparkle Masters in, in LA. They're often used, they're often used in display and in advertising, but they're always sparkly. And so it's, it's um, a, a company run by um, two brothers, and, and Larry has met them. And uh, they, you know, basically they're working out of their mother's basement. And, um, but they, they are fantastic to work with, and they solved lots of problems. So, so I had remembered way back in the 90s, there were signs on restaurants. Um, mostly uh, uh, Latin restaurants, Dominican restaurants that had these little discs and they would shimmer in the wind. And I thought they were so beautiful because they were, they were not electric. You didn't have to plug them in. And they, were, and they also uh, connected both to the light and to the wind and, um, and they're, they're gone. I don't know if there are any left in New York anymore. I, I, when we started working on this project, I went searching for them and could not find any. Um, so I was thinking about 
um, after, after speaking with Dan and some other people in uh, computer science about their interest in something that was um, you know, not, not electronic, but maybe connected to certain ideas of you know, ones and zeros, ons and offs, um, that these disks, because they move, they, they, can, they, they catch the light or they catch the, sh the shadow. And so they could be both things like that. So, so we worked basically to create these custom panels with these, these guys in LA. And um, they are, they're, so they're tiny metal disks that are held by a pin to a, to a panel. And they're, um, and they're painted with automotive paint so that they have that sort of flat total finish and that they're non-reflective. The, um, the panels are actually made out of two different materials um, because uh, we had issues with fire rating. And, um, and the panels that uh, Sparkle Masters, it's uh, <laughs> such a funny name, um, that Sparkle Masters uh, uses um, are not, were not to, to code but they are durable. So we used a, a different, less durable material on some of them that are inside and the, um, and the uh, ABS plastic ones around the outside because we could use a small number of them because they're more durable. So if someone touches them, they would, um, they, they would, they would resist uh, damage uh, much better than, than the Comatex. So that's the kind of all that technical stuff. That's, that's what a lot of uh, the time we spent all together uh, solving those problems to, ma to make it work and make it hopefully those issues be completely invisible. But the, the disks actually, um, they move with the HVAC and, um, and uh, Paul was telling me today that when, they're, when the uh, students are, when groups of students are moving through, they create wind that moves the, uh, the disks as well, which is fantastic. So, so the, the, there's a sort of shimmering that happens but it's really about color mixing. I didn't want it to be um, about uh, sparkles. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Well, I just want to do a quick thank you to Spencer for our lovely lecture this evening. And I would like to invite everyone downstairs to take a moment and look at the piece that's here installed. And we have hot cocoa and treats for anyone that would like to stay too, just for a little fun. So thank you for coming. <laughs>